to introduce our two guest lecturers for today, David Skinner, who will start, and then Richard Gerber. David and Richard are both uh, consultants and, and uh, computer systems engineers at LBL. They build and design and evaluate tools and advise users on how to use tools for writing parallel codes, in particular debugging performance and debugging correctness. Those are both going to be interesting challenges. And you might find these tools quite useful for your first programming, for your second programming assignment, which has just been posted. Um, so uh, David got his PhD here in chemistry, and Richard got his PhD at Illinois in physics. So if you have any questions about how to use these tools in those particular applications, I'm sure they can do a, a great job at answering those questions. So David. Great. Thank you, Jim. Is the uh, microphone working, this one? OK, super. Um, well, good morning, and uh, thank you, Jim. Um, Richard and I are here today to uh, talk about tools for performance debugging, and we blur performance and debugging uh, topics together quite, quite well. Um, lack of performance is, is a bug in some sense, and um, you know, a, an outright bug is the logical uh, you know, extreme of, of performance loss. Um, and our goal is to try to give you some techniques and some information for uh, the projects that you'll be doing on, uh, on NERSC systems that are fairly generalizable to other other projects, and um, we're, as Jim said, both at, at NERSC. We, uh, we use the term HPC applications, maybe with a little um, historical uh, perspective or baggage, how you look at it. Um, we're really um, come from a tradition of large uh, bulk synchronous uh, simulation codes, as opposed to, say, uh, high throughput codes or uh, map reduce or uh, graph, uh, big graph algorithms and stuff like that. So. In, in, in this, uh, maybe I could ask for a show of hands, how many people here, their computational interest lies outside of, say, big partial differential equation or linear algebra solution uh, type of thing? So yeah, some, okay. So most of this is applicable in, in, in broader senses, um, but you know, HPC can mean a lot of different things to different people, so we'll try to keep that in mind as we go through. <coughs> so, um, there's some very practical things that we can tell you about that hopefully will be useful on, uh, on NERSC machines. There are also, um, and what I'll be focusing on, are, are some sort of high-level principles about performance and, and debugging. And we're really trying to target people who are budding simulation scientists and application developers. Um, if you're uh, interested in, in developing tools yourself, uh, your mileage may vary a little bit here. This is really targeted towards sort of the, the, uh, the user community. Just real briefly about NERSC, um, I understand people have uh, logged in there and have had their first project that they've worked on there. Um, NERSC serves uh, the, the full spectrum of science topics uh, in, in computational science. Um, we're really trying to make these tools things that deliver uh, performance in a sustained way that, um, uh, as opposed to say, you know, individual benchmarks or things like that, but really sort of the long haul of making computational campaigns productive. Uh, we have lots of, lots of users. And we're, uh, we're not architecturally fixed. We try to take the, the best architectures that are out there that work for the largest number of, of uh, science teams. So some big picture of performance and scalability in terms of concepts. Um, the, the first one is that I would very much encourage you to think about performance as being something more than a single number. Um, you know, sometimes there is a single number, which is the, the, the first order bottleneck or is the um, you know the the thing that's that's giving you a headache today, but really, um, and is there is it possible to dim the lights a little bit at all? I'll, I'll work on it. Oh, if, if not, hopefully I'll, I'll walk through this in case it's not readable in the back. Is that there are a lot of steps in uh, bringing a, a, a computational program together? Thank you, Jim. Um, formulating a, a research problem, doing some coding, doing debugging, doing performance debugging running a lot of jobs uh, that are then going to wait in the queue? Is this generating a, a, a big pile of data that's uh, you know, uh, an issue to be dealt with? Doing uncertainty quantification and validation verification, that is looking at these jobs and that data and trying to determine whether or not you're getting the right answer for the right reason. And, um, and then you know, after you're through those steps, sort of uh, new understanding and publication. And um, you know, if, if uh, the, the focus is uh, solely on one of these areas, you know, you really may be missing uh, other areas where you can do performance optimization. So it's more, more than just the megaflop or gigaflop rate uh, or teraflop rate from your, uh, from your code. So all this, this 
sort of imagined chain of a, a research agenda here comes together in the sense that um, planning where to put effort and uh, realizing that optimization in one area can de-optimize another. So you know you, you might uh, code things very quickly uh, and that cuts down the amount of uh, uh, effort and time that's put there but then creates issues later. One that, that we, we see this a lot at NERSC is with data, is that the strategies for dealing with data that work at a small scale are in many cases fundamentally different than the strategies that work at a large scale. So uh, if you heard the term hitting the data wall, that's really uh, the sort of phenomenon where the printf or the ASCII output or whatever sort of strategy that was just fine for a small scale, when you go up to thousands or tens of thousands of cores, uh, is, is the, the, the first, becomes the first order bottleneck. I'd also, uh, as a second sort of very general point, offer that performance is, is relative, um, that um, measuring and judging performance of codes is something that should really be tied into the productivity of the research and, and the, the code that, that you're working with overall. Um, that is, that rather than it being sort of a number that will fall out of a tool, it's something for you to, to set a metric for about what, what uh, generates productivity and performance. So, the overall time to solution, for instance, is both the time spent in the queue and the, the wall clock time spent running the code. And so if optimizing things by finding a different queuing strategy or uh, a different uh, uh, overall runtime approach is, uh, is, is a fruitful area for, uh, for optimization. It's also relative to what your research agenda is and how to most efficiently use an allocation. Your, you're probably not allocation bound in this in this class right now. Uh, ultimately, to some point, you you might be, but in your later uh, computational science careers, you know you'll get 10 million hours, or you'll get you know 100 million hours probably, you know, uh, and, and figuring out how can I, with that allocation of time, accomplish the tasks that I that I want to get done, is a is a key uh, aspect of performance. So th there are a lot of different uh, factors that go into performance. The application code itself but also the input deck and the type of machine and the state. So one way to understand this is, yes? One interesting story. I think some students did use up a lot of their allocations trying to do auto-tuning in the ah, first okay, assignment. Okay, so yeah. there's another. <laughs> yeah. So the world has finite constraints. And, and uh, you know, trying to optimize within those constraints is how you find the, the real uh, solution. Um, one thing that, that is persistent in uh, kind of HPC folklore and maybe more broadly is, is that there's such a thing as a code that performs well, right? And I would uh, offer that, that um, hand me any code that you think performs really well, I can probably run it in a way that it doesn't, right? And uh, doing that intentionally is maybe not so interesting, but realizing that you can reach that state in a variety of different ways uh, unintentionally by changing the concurrency slightly or changing the input deck slightly, you can end up in a vastly different performance space. So there's no such thing as a highly performant cord, uh, code on its own. So targeting specific use cases and, and outcomes uh, is, is important because the bottlenecks in, in performance debugging can shift. So just very briefly about um, where we uh, focus on in, in performance, there's you know, serial uh, aspects of performance in parallel. Um, in the serial space, you know, feeding the pipelines, uh, being cognizant of what the caches are doing, exploiting data locality, and uh, you know, bringing the whatever sort of uh, uh, on-chip resources into full utilization uh, is is, uh, is important. At the parallel level, and here again, we'll lapse into thinking about parallelism generally uh, as MPI or uh, formalisms like that trying to find ways to, to form tasks and decompose domains in ways that expose more concurrency is, is key. Um, minimizing latency and maximizing the amount of work versus computing. So um, those are, are some of the, the core notions, again, at a very high level about performance debugging. A couple last sort of super general uh, <coughs> topics. One is that, is that performance is hierarchical in the, the sense of the resources that are being touched. So, um, you know, at, at the, the smallest level you have uh, registers which uh, operate on things as instructions and operands, caches and their lines, uh, uh, DRAM and its pages, remote memory and the messages that are used to interact with that, um, disk and file system, which, uh, you know, the vocabulary there are blocks and files. So. Um, 
any, you know, any of these levels can create a, uh, a performance uh, problem for, for a, a code. Um, and uh, it's important to, to sort of pay attention to the hierarchy of time scales and data sizes that are involved. So think globally, compute locally is what I would uh, uh, encourage you to uh, think about in this sort of hierarchical picture is that um, you can have uh, you know, local memory working really, really uh, well, but if you're spending a lot of time uh, accessing remote memory, then the, the time scale for that interaction is gonna be much higher. Okay, so that's the end of the uh, generalities, and I should say, if you have questions um, at any time, just raise your hand and let me know. So just as in the sense that computer architecture and um, the, the aspects, the resources that are being used by a code are hierarchical, the tools are hierarchical too. So imagining uh, you know, HPC tools as a toolbox rather than as a uh, one-size-fits-all sort of uh, methodology is something I'd very much encourage you to, to think about. And you don't always know coming in where is the bottleneck in a code, right? And so at the first order, sort of determining where that is is an important sort of thing. And you can either do that by using a, a tool that, that encompasses many levels of that hierarchy and, and gives you some uh, sort of performance summary, or by getting in and using individual tools that test the individual types of resources. And, you know, as it was, was with everything, you know, using the right tool for the job is, is key. Um, the, the ways that these tools um, impact the code uh, vary quite a lot. And so if you, for instance, want to get down into what the registers and caches are doing at a very, very fine-grained level, that's going to be um, have, have, uh, interrupt the code and be um, uh, impacting the code in ways that are very, very different than, for instance, profiling the file system. So some of these names here hopefully are, are familiar. Um, they'll, they'll be uh, explained uh, in, in the context of NERSC further by Richard. Um, Pappy is the performance API. It's the thing that, that saves you as an application developer from having to understand the detailed architectural aspects of in the Intel Core Duo 2 or you know, uh, Opteron, whatever. Um, yes? Actually, I, I, we have not talked about these tools yet, so. Okay, okay, so let, let, me, let me just introduce them a little bit. So the performance API is a, a, a mechanism to, uh, to interrogate on-chip counters um, and more recently, other things like power, uh, power counters and things like that. So on a, on a CPU or on a GPU, there are counters that indicate resource utilization along the lines of memory traffic or uh, floating point uh, uh, operations completed, lots of, lots of different things there. They're, they're implemented in ways that are, that are arcane and, and largely designed for the chip manufacturers and the electrical engineers involved in that process. And so. The uh, performance API uh, is a portable API that allows you to ask performance and resource questions um, without having to know the individual particular the particulars of that architecture overall. And it's um, so if if you want to get a flop count or something like that, it's a library that you can call to ask those questions. Valgrind is a uh, is a is a memory tool that uh, allows you to look for memory leaks, um, you know, memory that's not being freed, that's being allocated. Um, those sorts of things. Uh, in the remote memory space, th there's the message passing interface, which is used to, to send messages. There's a, a tool layer on top of that called PMPI, uh, which is uh, wrappers that allow you to, to trap uh, the, the messages that are sent, not in, not in the sense of trapping the messages before they're sent, but in terms of asking questions about how many messages um, and uh, how long do the messages take. Yeah, I just want to mention that there's also options for Valgrind called, so one of them is, you know, track your memory. It tells you everything about how you're using your memory. Another one is you can go dash cache grind. Oh, yeah. And it has a wonderful cache modeling ability. So you can actually find out about evictions in your caches, conflicts in your caches. You know, are you using your L1, L2, L3 transfers all very well? It creates a whole virtual model of your cache for you. It's a complicated tool, so not all of you are going to go in there. But for those who do want it, it's a very nice capability. Yeah, and there, there Valgrind has a few other uh, modules as well. And um, the general way to look at this hierarchy, I think, is that you know these are architecturally very different sorts of resources, and that the 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 first layer of tools here are things that are technologically very well suited to those layers in the hierarchy. And then there are other tools, Craypat and IPM and Tau, 
that um, obviate the need for you to really delve into that in, as, in, in a great detail. They give you an overall picture of your code. And the other way to think about dividing this is these are command line uh, on node sort of tools where you, you know, either are calling a function or calling a command on a piece of code that's running on that node, and that these are tools that are really stepping outside of that into the message passing space or into the, the, into the file system space. So how do tools work? Um, the general methodologies for, uh, for the performance tools, at least, are, are sampling and, and tracing. And sampling is a statistical process where there are either interrupts, uh, time-based interrupts or counter-based interrupts that, uh, that stop the program uh, periodically and ask some questions about performance counter states or res other resource utilization. And the, the frequency with which they're called you know, is crucially important to what sort of statistical profile you can build up. It's also crucially important to the, uh, the impact that that has on the code, because if you're, if you're sampling the code and interrupting it um, very, very frequently, particularly for a parallel code, you can end up in a different performance space than, than um, you might uh, perceive to be. Uh, tracing and instrumenting insert hooks into the program so that every time you call, say, MPI send, somebody gets notified that, hey, there was an MPI send, it was this big, it took this long that type of thing. Um, so uh, these are typically d d is, is trapped and recorded, whereas sampling is, uh, is statistically based. For performance tools, one of the key resources that we rely on, and this is that the PAPI that we were discussing, are hardware event counters. And um, these are, are uh, registers that can be read that, um, that vary from processor to processor. Um, typically, you can get floating point instructions for pretty much any CPU or GPU that's out there. Um, there's a, a vast array of other possible events, and um, you'll be lucky to, uh, to find clear meanings for many of these, too. So I wouldn't, don't, don't view this as a set of counters that are designed to be tailored to you, the programmer, um, to, to, to determine, but really that they're, they're there on the chip, and if they happen to be useful and have clear meanings, then that's... that's uh, Positive, yeah. J just to tell one story, we had an, a meeting at Intel to talk about their hardware counters once. There were hundreds and hundreds of different counters. And uh, even the Intel engineers uh, you know, used machine learning techniques to try to interpret what they meant. So it's good <laughs> to have a nice uh, interface for this. Yeah. Um, and that, that, again, that's, that's why Pappy, unless you are you know, just uh, you know, oddly interested in the, the inner workings of you know, chip flavor A or B, uh, Pappy is the place to go, or a tool that, that draws on Pappy, because it will take the pieces of information that are known to be good and, and uh, label them as things that are, are uh, communicative of, of what they actually are. Another, you know, kind of unfortunate aspect of uh, hardware event counters is that typically on, on chips these days we only get about four, you know, four to eight counters that, that we can read at a time. So. When you, when you uh, do a set of performance debugging uh, experiments, you may have to do multiple runs where you measure one set of counters one time and another set of counters another time. And that's just because even though there are these hundreds of counters, uh, you're only uh, allowed to, to get at a handful of them uh, simultaneously. So what will a tool uh, require of you? Um, Sometimes it means that you need to modify your code, uh, sometimes not. Uh, the modifications could be macros, they could be uh, API calls, they could be uh, you know, timers or other things. In many cases, and Hopper is, is one of these, is that the static executables are used, so most tools will require you to recompile your code. For you know, most of the projects you're working on here, you're, you're compiling them anyway, so that's not a big deal. Um, Sometimes you may need to take the binary that's produced and then transform it in some way, either by relinking or more in-depth sort of uh, instrumentation that's put in. And then typically when you, when you run uh, with a tool, you'll get some extra output, which is the performance data, either a profile or a trace or, or other description. And then uh, to be able to interpret the, the results uh, with a tool or to be able to read the report from the tool. The sort of topics that, um, that we can get from the tools that we'll be discussing are Flop rate, um, how much memory am I using? Uh, how much time is spent in uh, OpenMP locks? Um, uh, how can you tune the, the number of threads that are used in OpenMP? Um, this is a type of 
scalability study that applies to threads and MPI tasks, and we'll have some examples coming up here in a bit. With MPI, uh, the first order thing is how much time are you spending in, in MPI? Because MP MPI inherently does nothing for you, uh, you know, to, to move your, your research along other than move, move data around and do some reductions and things like that. So if, if you're spending a lot of time communicating and little time computing, in uh, all the cases I can think of, that's, that's uh, something to avoid. Load imbalance, which I'll talk about here in a couple slides, is uh, another first order issue. Did, and you did a, a project so far in uh, matrix multiplication. Did anybody uh, encounter load imbalance issues with that? Or? It's a uniprocessor. Oh, it's a uniprocessor. Okay, well, you may encounter it later. So load imbalance uh, in the MPI space means when you divide up work amongst the different, these different sort of remotely connected uh, sockets or you know, however you want to think of them, remotely connected uh, CPUs, um, that division of labor uh, is, is something that in some cases is quite clear and you can evenly divide the work and that's fine. In some cases you may not know how much time is or how many flops or, or wall clock time is going to be required for each element of that domain. And so keeping everything balanced so that you don't have processors waiting on other processors is, is really a key um, uh, paramount thing nowadays because the, the number of cores that you'll be using in your parallel codes has is, is, uh, gotten to be quite large. And typically sending big messages is better than sending tons of small ones, so that's another thing we can um, use a tool to, to let us know about. Um, I, I mentioned this before, using the, the right tool is important. Um, uh, tools can add overhead to code execution. Uh, they can add overhead to you as a uh, scientist in terms of the learning curve for the tool or the steps that you have to go through. You know, is this a, is using the tool a three-step process or is it a 16-step process, right? And um, that's the kind of overhead I mean for, for scientists. Um, determining, you know, the right tool to use is, comes down to partly what you want to do. If you want to figure out um, a code that is just generally slow and, and, you know, figure out a first-order bottleneck, one of these more uh, all-encompassing uh, cross-hierarchy tools is probably a good place to start. If you need detailed performance uh, debugging information, maybe you can pick a, a smaller tool. And the, the third is that you think that, um, that the performance of the, the code is, is quite good, but you're going to be doing 100 or 1,000 runs, and you want to make sure that as you put these different inputs in and you craft these different uh, jobs at maybe different concurrencies, that across a large number of jobs, you're not doing anything to clobber the performance uh, or some uh, across those. So by in production, I mean sort of that you've already gone through the performance debugging uh, scenarios that you want to hit, but then you want to make sure that in the, the bulk of the jobs that you run, that, that you're retaining that performance that you've achieved uh, in isolation. Um, not every code will get, uh, you know, 100% utilization. And, you know, I, I know of codes that are, uh, feel quite good getting sort of 12 percent of peak uh, utilization. So that, that's all very relative to the type of problem that you're solving. These are um, some, some values that I wanted to put up just to show that they are less than um, uh, less than 100 percent and uh, these are a variety of uh, computing and memory metrics um, and uh, that, that are suggested by Cray that say you're doing you know uh, you're doing pretty well if um, if you're um, you know at 90 percent or 25 percent in some cases of uh, of full utilization. This question this yeah. doesn't depend on the application these numbers. This is is some gloss across all okay. different applications or whatever, and and that's what I'm saying is that you know a, an application that achieves 12 percent peak performance may be uh, doing a stellar job. You right. know, and depending uh, on the app. Yeah, and. Um, you know, the difference between, for instance, doing sparse matrix methods and dense ones, you know, you can hit very different performance numbers, but, you know, hitting a performance number is not necessarily, or an arbitrary performance number is not necessarily the goal of uh, your, your research. Um, let's see. I better speed it up here a little bit. Um, one of the, the tools that we rely on at NERSC is uh, called Integrated Performance Monitoring. It does uh, MPI profiling, hardware counter metrics, tells you about I.O. Um, on some systems, you can just type module load IPM and then run as you normally would, and you'll get a little banner, which I'll show, that, um, that tells you kind of a dashboard of performance. Um, 
on Hopper uh, as opposed to Carver, you do need to relink because I mentioned, as I mentioned there, everything is uh, statically uh, uh, executed there. So this is the sort of uh, report that you get from IPM. Um, it tells you the command that you ran, when it started, when it stopped, how many tasks uh, it ran on, what the aggregate uh, memory utilization was, that is, across all the, the nodes and tasks, a little bit about where it ran, how long it ran, how much what the percentage time spent communicating was, and the gigaflop rate. So that's um, not very detailed information, but it's maybe an indication of where to, where to get started. If you, you can set an environment variable, and um, that will uh, give you a lot more numbers. This, these are um, uh, the min, max, and average uh, across uh, Floating point, uh, FPU0, FPU1, that's the, the two different floating point units. Um, the number of fused multiply add operations that were completed, uh, loads completed, stores completed, TLB misses, and the number of clock cycles. And then this is a breakdown of not just the percentage time spent communicating, but which MPI calls in particular uh, contributed to that. Uh, so as a aside here, some advice is, is to develop some portable techniques. Not, not every technique needs to be portable. And if you have a, a tool that, that is, you know, a Cray-based tool that's really good, that's great to use it. But realize that someday you'll probably be computing on, you know, something that's not a Cray. And so to have some, some performance debug uh, methodology in your repertoire uh, that's portable is, is great because, um, you know, it allows you to, to compare across architectures. It allows you to have some things built into your code that you can count on just working when you, know, when you get to a different architecture. And uh, I, I have a little plug for printf down here on the bottom. Don't, don't rely on printf you know, for everything, but um, there, there are some, some people for whom they think they kind of uh, look down at printf as uh, you know, something that, that should not be used. And I, I would say that it has a place. If you can put a few timers in your code, that when you run it, you can have a track record of understanding how much time is in the solver, how much time is in you know loading the data, how much time is in the transpose. You know those sorts of things are are wonderful performance metrics to be able to get, and and uh, yeah, printf really does deliver them. Uh, real quick, some examples of uh, using HPC tools. The OpenMP scalability and MPI scalability that I mentioned earlier um, rely on, or doing a scaling study relies on some concepts about the extensiveness of the computing and the extensiveness of the problem. Um, for are you, is strong scaling and weak scaling are ideas that have we been? Done those. Okay, so I'll hit them very briefly here and there's lots more to learn about this, but um, with strong scaling you have a problem that you want to solve, a, a 500 by 500 matrix or something, and that's all you're interested in because that's your, pro that's your problem. In weak scaling, you may be, as you add more memory, as you add more CPUs, you might want to do a bigger problem. So, uh, for instance, in climate modeling, uh, they get more accurate the more uh, cells they break down the, the earth and the ocean into, right? So if you have 100 cores, you might do a very different type of problem than you would if you had uh, a million cores. And so, you know, in weak scaling, the problem grows with the additional resources. And so how does bringing parallel computing to either a fixed problem or a, 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 an elastic problem uh, help you out? Two key ways to measure, measure that are speed up and efficiency. So the, the speed up is just the serial time divided by the parallel time. And if uh, you had perfect scalability, the speed up would be linear with the number of, uh, of additional uh, cores that you, that you add. And um, the, the efficiency is a, just a, sort of a, another measure of that in terms of how well you're using the additional resources that you bring to the party. So it's a deviation from speed up, from linear speed up. So, so there N is the number of processors. Oh yeah, so N is, N is the number of processors. So uh, this is T1, so you have you know, one, one core, it's a serial code. This is the, the time that it takes to do in parallel using N uh, processes. And, uh, if that was perfect, you know, for every uh, core that you added, you'd just uh, divide the, the serial time by that, that number. And in some places, there are different definitions for these things. Um, in some cases, for instance, maybe there is no serial number that you could measure, because if, if there is no 
um, you know, if there, for a fixed problem size, maybe um, you can't fit it onto one core, right? So you can never do the comparison between the one core calculation and the, the thousand core calculation. So how do you do a scaling study? Um, I, I go back to this idea that performance is more than one number. It's good to, to really look at the performance landscape overall about um, you know, how, how does problem size and concurrency uh, change a problem. So this is looking at uh, how large a 3D uh, FFT can efficiently run on 1024 CPUs. And this is uh, N is the, the size of the, the, uh, the cube. Um, and we did samples at 100 cores at uh, 256 you know, sort of on up. So there's, there's one, two, three, four samples here. And it looks like, you know, there's a pretty clear upward trend where the, the uh, performance, uh, in this case, the flop rate is going up as we, as we bring more, um, more problem to the fixed set of cores. And, you know, this is a lot better than doing two, I mean, the, the, I guess the worst way to do it would be you do two measurements and draw a line between it. And you say that's, you know, that's, the, the scaling law for this uh, code. Um, but if you look a little deeper, um, there, there's a lot more texture to the performance landscape than this. And so the 1024 numbers are right here. And if you notice, you know, the, the, on powers of two, we just happened to hit, uh, you know, some, a trajectory that went up. But the, the, uh, if you vary the problem size more, more finely, the performance varies much more wildly. And um, this is on a variety of different tasks, and you can see that uh, this is one of the ways by which a small change in the input, you know, changing the, the dimension of a matrix by a small amount could yield a very, very, uh, you know, big change in, in the delivered performance. And in this case, this is a, a particularly well-known case with, uh, with FFTs that the, the algorithm uh, depends on the prime factorization of the dimensions of the, uh, of the, the matrix. And so in this case, you know, prime factorization is not a smooth function of the, the number n. So the difference between a 1024 cubed uh, calculation and a, um, and a 1025 uh, cubed calculation could be very, very different. Let me add that we will have a lecture on parallel FFTs later in the semester. Yeah. So, and in this case, this is, is not meant to be an um, instruction about FFT. You could replace FFT here with, you know, pick your al algorithm of choice. And if you do have smooth performance variation with concurrency and, uh, and problem size, that's great. But many, many algorithms don't. So yeah, the, the texture here is from algorithm switching. Uh, it could be from coming from the machine in terms of communication protocol switching. Um, uh, it could be that there's just noise in the machine in terms of uh, contention with other jobs or uh, never, never count out the notion of bugs in somebody else's software. So is n the cube size? Yes, yeah. So why the larger and the higher performance? Um, so the, the, for, for larger n, one is doing a, a, a larger number of floating point operations, you know, per unit, per unit time. Or how, yeah, you can't keep a thousand processors as busy with a small FFT as with a large one. So, you know, the efficiency is lower. And uh, we will have performance models later that explain, explain that. Um, that there's more communication overhead if you add more processors and keep the problem size fixed. Yeah. So the, that example was a tricky one. I wanted to include one that's not. This is a number of th threads versus uh, runtime. And this performance landscape is relatively smooth. And that's, that's great, you know, but um, not, not everything is that smooth. Here's an example of load imbalance where uh, these 1,024 tasks are, uh, you know, d are shown here in how much time they spend in different MPI calls. And you can see that there's a group of uh, uh, tasks over there, of uh, 64 tasks there at the end, that spend significantly uh, less time in the MPI all to all. And as a result, they're sort of slowing down the other tasks that um, that are, are spending less time there. So um, having performance be smooth uh, and, and sort of linear as you add more concurrency is the ideal case. Having the domain decomposition be flat across uh, the tasks is an ideal case as well. Where does load imbalance come from? And I'll wrap up after this. Is, um, you know, 
I asked earlier if people had uh, codes or, or were interested in, in computing problems that aren't simulation based. This is one example where sort of this uh, bias towards simulation based codes may show up is that our uh, sort of universal notion of, uh, of an application here is something that has a big outer loop, right? And if, if for some high throughput uh, uh, type of calculations and other things, you don't have that. But for a huge number of codes, you do have some sort of synchronization some work and then some I.O. where that I.O. could be communication or, or dis on disk or whatever. And you just do that over and over and over again. Um, and that's, you know, uh, partial differential equations, a lot of other things sort of uh, work that way. Krylov solvers and um, if the, the amount of uh, green time, that is the amount of, of uh, compute work that's uh, given to these tasks varies across tasks, then you end up spending more time in the synchronization phase. So the the amount of red time in the unbalanced is much bigger than in the balanced. And so um, there are lots of ways to achieve load imbalance, uh, unfortunately. And uh, let me thank you again for advertising another lecture we will have later in the semester on okay. load balancing techniques. OK. Um, OK, the last thing I want to say is about optimization in the batch queue space. Um, it's interesting to hear that and encouraging people were running out of time with their, their allocations. Uh, that, that's a good real world experience. Um, so optimizing in the batch queue space, there, there are charge factors for how fast you want to get through the queue. And the faster you want to get through, the more expensive it is. So if you can uh, optimize in the, in the space of uh, choosing a, a different queue, that's fine. There are uh, you know, priority queues, there are scavenger queues, which you say, um, you know, I'll use some cycles, but I, maybe my code will get inter interrupted. Um, if you're doing data uh, processes along with your compute processes, sometimes you can downshift the concurrency into a, a transfer queue and have, have things work there. Um, and, you know, consider the constraints within the queues uh, and whether or not you can checkpoint as well. So, um, oh yeah, the very last thing is consider that jobs can submit other jobs, right? So if you have a big concurrency part and a small concurrency part, when the big concurrency part is done, you can say, okay, now, let, now let's go do the, the small concurrency stuff and then so, go back so and So just there. clarification, the queues that you're referring to are the queues that NERSC runs to yeah. submit jobs, not the queues that one might build inside one's own program. Yeah, that's right. These are batch queues. And so, um, you know, the, the, uh, the optimization that I'm talking about here is in terms of how to efficiently use the allocation that you have. Um, yeah. Okay, so with that, I'll uh, switch over to Richard. All these slides should now be posted on the web page. So I was setting my timer for, I was going to set a timer with a little alarm here, and it started playing. I don't know if any of you heard it, but um, I thought I'd like to have a little quiz for you here. Let's see if I can do it. I'd like you to raise your hand if you know what this sound is. <laughs> Good, there's a few people still, so I'm not quite as old as I thought I was. <laughs> But technology moves forward quickly. All right, let's see if I can start this. Resume. For the people who didn't raise their hand, you have to say. Oh, so who, who didn't recognize that sound? There's one. There are a few. So that's the sound of a modem. So we used to, the only way to communicate with computers not that many years ago was through phone lines, and this was how the, um, the signal got multiplexed through the system. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, some debugging and optimization tools. And I noticed David and I had a few slides in common, so I'll try to skip over this quickly. But I'm a consultant at NERSC, and so everything I'm going to talk about is really from my perspective of trying to help people use HPC systems and how they use them. A lot of the people that do use our systems are scientists rather than um, they're domain scientists rather than computer scientists. So as a brief outline, I wanted to mention that we have uh, a web, uh, web page at, at www.nurse.gov for this class, and specifically for th these, uh, this lecture. 
So I've dumped a few things in there, and there's some videos that show how to use things, and I'll put some more references, and we'll put our slides there also. So you will have a reference there. And then I'd also like to um, put in a plug for the Axe Toolkit, which is hosted at Berkeley Lab. It is, you see it has a NERSC domain. And it's the DOE Advanced Computational Tools, so visit that website, and they have lots of links and um, a lot more discussion on a lot of the tools. So t for today, what I'd like you to take away um, is some of the common problems to look for and how tools work in general. David talked about that a little bit, and we'll have a few more examples uh, um, and a few specific tools you can try. So there are lots and lots and lots of tools out there. Somebody already mentioned Valgrind, probably somebody that's an expert in Valgrind. So you may have your favorite tool that I may not even mention today. But it's important to find what tool works well for you. Okay. And so we're not going to cover all of them. And then I hope I give you some links into where you can find more information. I'm going to start with debugging. So what is a bug? A bug is when your code crashes, obviously. Um, it hangs. That's another thing we see often. Or it gets inconsistent or wrong results. So inconsistent answers um, are really bad when you have a sequential program. But now you're going to start talking about parallel programs, and you end, you you usually want to get consistent answers, but sometimes it's not quite so obvious because there's some indeterminism in when different processors finish, and if you do things in such a way that the order in which they finish matters, you might not get the same answers all the time. But in general, if your code behaves in any way you don't want it to, I'm going to call that a bug. Just a little historical perspective, the term bug was um, not invented, but popularized by Grace Hopper, who was a admiral in the U.S. Navy and for whom our main machine at NERSC now is named after. So um, it was actually motivated, motivated by the move of an actual moth from a computer relay. And there's the notes of the, the people that were work, working to build these early computers in the 40s. And so they found this moth and taped it to their notes. And there's a picture of it. So that's the, where the word bug came from. So what are some of the common causes of bugs? In serial or sequential might actually be a better um, word for that. Things like invalid memory references, like you try to do something um, in a memory location that you shouldn't. So an, uh, an easy way to do that is try to reference an array that's out of bounds. So you declared an array to be size 30, and you try to, um, index, try to reference index 32. Or maybe you divide by a 0, or you declare a variable but you don't initialize it, so the, the value is unpredictable and, and random. In parallel, you have things like unme you, sent, you, have a, you try to send a message to one processor, but you, don't, you forget to receive it on that processor, maybe. Or there are also these blocking um, sends, and there's blocking and non-blocking sends in MPI, which you'll learn about. But if you try to do a blocking, if you block on something that something else is waiting for, and You've got two, you'll see an example of that in a second, but say two processes are both waiting for each other and they have, neither one has sent it yet. It's obviously going to hang. Um, you could call, you can get a complicated program where you have a lot of <clears throat> collective calls, but maybe they, they execute out of order because you're not really paying attention. And then, then there's also race conditions where um, things are trying to maybe write and read from memory locations and they're assuming that something's happened that hasn't actually happened because of this kind of indeterminism in when a parallel process is going to reach a certain point in a program. So you might need to have synchronization that you don't have. So in general, what do you do if you have a bug? Well, obviously, you want to find it. Then you want to fix it. And then don't forget to check it and see if it runs again. So really, the tools I'm going to talk about today really um, concentrate on that first part. It would really be nice if the tool could not only help you find where your bug was, but that it could also suggest what you might do to fix it. Um, so if there's any budding tool writers out there, keep that in mind. That would be a great thing to have. And of course, don't forget to check it. So here's some of the tools that David alluded to already. So printf. In fact, printf is one of the most popular debugging tools that we see. And you're right, it often gets scowls from people and they look down on it and say that's a horrible thing to do, especially people that write tools. But often, you know, it's very versatile. It, you can always do it. And sometimes it's useful. The problem is it really doesn't scale well. So if you go in your program and you're trying to figure out why it doesn't get to subroutine X, and you put I'm at subroutine, about to enter subroutine X, and you have a million threads, um, that's going to be a problem real quickly. I'm probably not the only person who had the experience. I put in the printf and the bug went away. It only okay. occurred when I, the printf was not there. So. 
So this is, a, this is a, I don't have a slide to this. I actually th thought about it, didn't know how far to go in. But that's an excellent point is often you, you want your code to run fast. So you compile it with all these high optimization levels in a compiler. And it runs fast, but it crashes quickly. Okay, so you say, oh dear, what am I going to do? So you can put a printf in. You can turn on some debugging in the compiler. And by gosh, the bug goes away completely. This is not uncommon. And it's, beca and it's because you are, when you put in a printf, or you put in this, you turn off this optimization, it undoes, it undoes a lot of the optimizations the compiler is trying to do, which is actually where the bug is getting introduced. And so you're making it go away. Or you're making something, or you have a race condition, and you're making everything execute slower, or in, 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 uh, in order, and the bug just goes away. So, yes. And, a printf is not interactive at all, and if you have, like David was talking about, a queuing system where you have to wait hours, days, for each of your jobs to run, it's really going to be very painful with printf. And really, it's just a fish, often a fishing expedition. You're just, you're just hunting around trying to figure out where it is. There are a lot of things. There's, uh, there's debugging that people often don't think about, and that's that the compiler and the runtime system can actually help you with a lot of your debugging. So you can turn on switches in the compiler that will... Um, Check things like function and subroutine interfaces to make sure you have the right calls and the, I mean the right number of parameters and that sort of thing. And the runtimes on a lot of these um, compilers can do things like check the bounds in an array. They can um, help you with exception handling. What I, I think what I really meant to put there was something about floating point exceptions, and I'll mention that in a minute. And of course, see if you try to like, dereference null pointers, that sort of thing. There are serial tools. Some people, some of you may are be familiar with GDB. Has anybody used GDB before? Which is the GNU debugger? Yes. Yeah, so almost everybody uses GDB. So it's good and it's useful. Um, you have to learn how to use it. And the man page is probably the best way to figure that out. And then there are these parallel debuggers that actually use X Windows to give you a graphical user interface. And the two most popular ones, and really the only two in the HPC space right now, are um, one called DDT. Right? DDT stomps out bugs. Who knows what DDT is in other contexts, right? It's this insecticide. Um, and then total view. As an example of, how, of what the compiler can do for you, there are a couple of things you might not think about. And compilers in general, by default, will happily let you access arrays out of bounds. If your code doesn't crash, it, you won't know it. And it will also happily let you do things like take square roots of negative one and divide by zero and this sort of thing. And if, you, if it doesn't crash or doesn't give you the wrong answers, well, you don't know it, although you're certainly going to get the wrong answers, but you may not know it. So you can, put on, you can turn on switches um, when you compile your program. So the K, in this case, for this compiler, which is, the, I think, the Portland Group compiler um, at NERSC, this k trap equals fp means it will trap on floating point exceptions. So if you do something illegal with a floating point number, like divide by zero, it'll tell you. And the m bounds tells you if you, if you try to access an array out of bounds. The, the big disadvantage is your code will run a lot slower with these things turned on. So just, just since I haven't mentioned this before, so what happens when you take the square root of minus one or divide by you know, zero by zero, you get a special symbol called not a number, and it just propagates through your code, and it does arithmetic with those. And, and if you divide one by zero, you get infinity, and that propagates through the code. And unless you tell it to stop, uh, it'll just keep going. Thanks. So you see here what, ha you know, uh, I'll skip some of the details, but when I try to run this code, at the runtime, we'll say, look, my, your subscript's out of range for array this um, on this line, and you tried to use subscript number 35, and it's only defined up to subscript, subscript 34. Unfortunately, each compiler has different flags and different ways you turn these things on and off, and, blah, blah, blah. and really the, only, the best way to figure that out is to read the man page for the specific compiler you're looking, trying to use. Okay. So uh, maybe a little bit ahead of the class here, but I wanted to give an example of a parallel programming bug. We, we have talked about deadlocks and race oh, okay. conditions and MPI and OpenMP, so this is a good example. Oh, okay. So um, if you look at this little code snippet, you'll see that I've done something that you would never do on purpose except to make a little code snippet like this. But because the codes can get very complicated, you know, think it's very easy to do this kind of thing. 
So we've got some number of MPI tasks going here. And you see task zero is trying to talk to task n minus one, but they're both trying to receive something from each other before they send it to each other. So this is a blocking call, so it'll just, those two tasks will just block there, waiting for the other for a message that will never come. So let's look at, the DDT is the main, is really the main production de, uh, debugger we have at NERSC now. So let's look at this with DDT. So how would we do this? Well, we'd make our code with the G switch on to turn on um, symbols for debugging, your source code. And then you have to set up the parallel run environment. So on the craze, and in fact, of a lot of parallel computers, when you log in and you're working um, at the command line, you're just working on essentially a Linux box. So to actually be able to run parallel programs, you need to set up the environment to do that. So um, at NERSC, you do that with the Q sub command. You use Q sub dash I for interactive. V is very important because that imports all your current environment variables and things into the parallel environment. And then different machines are different, but on the craze, you specify how many cores you want to use or how many nodes with this MPP width value. So with MPP width 24 on Hopper right now, which has 24 cores per node, that's giving you one node, but 24 MPI tasks. And then this line just um, changes your working directory back to the directory you started from. So you start the DDT debugger, oops, I left out a line. So first you have to load the module. It says module load DDT. I'll add that back in. And then you start it with um, just the command and DDT and then you're executable. So the windows start up, the program starts, it takes, it takes a little bit of time to do that sometimes. And then you're, pre you're presented with an X Windows application like this. So you press go, there's a little green button up there. And since I know, th I'd, I've observed that this code hangs, yes? So does this need to be run in the interactive queue, right? So if you, d if you go back, if you d the question is, does this need to run in the interactive queue? Let's see. This line right here, Q sub dash I, oh, I'm not I sure what I said before actually, but I is for interactive. Okay. So it starts in an interactive queue. So if the machine is completely 100% full, this, this command right here could just hang. But we have, during the daytimes, reserved some nodes, a fair amount, number of nodes on Hopper for interactive jobs. So in all likelihood, you'll get at least a job this small will start pretty quickly. So it brings up this GUI. And then there's little buttons up here that you press the green go and it starts from executing your program under the debugger. So I've witnessed before that this program hangs after a little while, the way I wrote it, it's not very long. So I let it run that long until it hangs. And if I want to, I can click on this tab and see what the, this standard output is. Then I hit the pause button. So the pause button is right there next to it and you see that it's hit. So if you look at the display here, you'll see that this source code, this um, is the source code, and this um, tool is telling me that task zero, which the highlighted one up there, is at line 44, and it highlights it, okay. So it's sitting at MPI receive. And if you look down here in the, win the what's called the, the parallel stack window, it's kind, it's kind of little on this display, and it's kind of, actually kind of little on your display too, but it will tell you that there's three, ta that there's three different lines that various tasks are on. And it says that one of them runs on line 44, one's on line 47, and one, two of them are on line 54. So if you click up here on task or process three, it brings up a different display. It shows you that you're on line 47. And you can see that it's waiting on a receive. And I should have another screenshot, but I, I didn't make one. If you clicked on either of the other two tasks, either one or two, it would bring up a display and it would show you that they were, they were basically finished. So now you know that all the tasks except for those two are finished and they're both sitting on um, receives. So that helps you figure it out, but it still takes some intelligence on your part to figure out what that actually means. So the progress bars are progress through the source code in the bottom? Those little blue, blue bars. That's a good question. It, appear, it looks like it is. Okay. Like and, is. and how do you tell that it's actually hung at that line as opposed to that just happens to be where you hit pause and it was about to go that, on? I don't. Okay. Except that I, when I ran it, I observed that it hung after 
a while, but I also observed I was writing things out to standard output, and I know when it hung there. But you're, you're right, you don't actually know that it doesn't tell you that it's hung, that I've been here for, a while. that I'm hung, right? You don't, don't actually know it. So you're right, it, ta it takes, some, takes some intuition and some trial and error. Uh, two questions. So we had talked about the little blue bars being the progress through the source code. Yeah. Does that like, is that like literal, will it like go back and forth if you're in a loop? That's a good question that I can't answer because I haven't okay. tried the experiment. Um, and, and the other but, question is, we talked about this in the context of sort of up to a single node. Will this behave properly if you're yes. launching a job in multiple nodes? So I did this on a single node because it's, it's easy to schedule. Okay. Right. So the, the fact that it was a single node really is irrelevant. Okay. Okay. I could have used as many as I want. And actually, that's, that's um, kind of DDT and total views. Um, why they're prominent is because they do scale up to thousands of processors in a, in a reasonably interactive way. So I've put a video up that kind of walks you through how you actually start DDT and use it and some more than I can talk about today. I looked at it yesterday and it's a little bit out of date, so I'll fix it probably this week. But if you do actually watch it, it talks about using this NX server, which is an X Windows accelerator which I would highly recommend. It says connect to Euclid. That's wrong now. You should connect to this machine called NX. And um, at the time I made it, Hopper wasn't yet in production, apparently. And it was called Hop2, but now it's called Hopper. So some other debugging tips, and these maybe are kind of random, but based on um, my experience of the kind of things users call in commonly for, is I. One thing that's often overlooked, too, is I think possibly the best be debugging tool out there is to take your code and try to compile it with as many different compilers as you can possibly use. Because different compilers have different language specification compliances. Some are very strict. So if you do something that the language says you can't, they'll yell at you and they won't compile your code. Other ones are like, you know, Whatever, people do this all the time, so I make an exception for this. It's okay, it's not really, not really what the language says you have to do, but um, it's okay in most cases. Um, so, so many people call in and say, my code, I'm having trouble with my code, and it'll only compile with compiler X. I said, well, have you tried compiler Y? Well, it crashes. Uh, how about this one? Oh, well, it won't compile. Okay, so if you can, if you can make your code compile with a number of different compilers, you probably are doing very well. Look for memory corruption. That's another thing we see is that, you know, if you, if you corrupt your memory anywhere in your program, it's probably not going to crash the moment you do that. It's going to crash somewhere else. So it's going to look like you're crashing someplace and you stare and stare and stare at that code and it looks like it's just perfectly good, wonderful code. And it is. But what's happened is that the memory that it's trying to reference there has been corrupted by something you did somewhere else in your program. That's very common. So using memory debuggers like Valgrind or some of these other tools have memory debugging built in also is a good idea, but it's, it's you know, a multi-hour lecture to figure out how to use those things. And also check the arguments to your MPI calls. In particular, make sure that you have data types um, set correctly. I guess you'll learn more about that later. But that's a common thing we see also. And then finally, call us. We're, that's what we're there for. So, now we'll uh, move on to performance and optimization. So um, some of these, David, some of these slides are, are common with David, but um, so how can we, the idea behind performance optimization is um, how can we tell if a program is performing well or if it isn't? And if it's not good, can we figure out why? And what do we do about it? So really, the, the, met, the, the one metric that you care about really is how long does it take for your code to run. But that really doesn't tell you anything about how efficiently you're using the hardware. So if you, if you optimize, if you get it better and better, yes, it's getting better, but you don't know how good it could be. And that's a very difficult question. Some things to look at are these derived measures like rates, messages per unit time, flops per second, like, like David mentioned before, clocks per instruction, or, or whatever. And then David also talked about scalability. 
And David went through this slide too. Um, a couple, one thing that I'd like to point out that I added is for both serial and parallel for everything, um, really, and even more with the architectures we're going to today, the, the real rule of thumb is to, to minimize your data movement, whether that's data moving from the processor to cache or to maybe a GPU or through the network. Minimize data movement. Minimize data movement. It used to be, um, when I started doing this and for years and years after, the, the focus was on minimize the number of flops you do. You know, your code will run faster the fewer calculations you have to do. That's not necessarily true anymore. And in fact, it may in many cases be cheaper to recalculate things many times in a parallel program than to take that data and ship it all over the place. And we will indeed illustrate that in later lectures. Okay, good. Another thing people don't think about often is we now have processors, NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access. We now have single, process, single processors themselves that might have multiple cores that have m memory domains within them that are not uniform. So it might be that the memory on the other side of just the chip, not the memory on another node, is slower for you to access than the memory that is closer to you on that chip. So the common things, peop way people try to get around that now is when you allocate your memory, fill it up with something, and that's called touch it, right? So if you do a malloc or you allocate memory in your program, your Linux will let you malloc whatever you feel like. You could malloc, you know, all the memory in the, in the universe, but it only really allocates it when you first do something with it. So if you go through and malloc your memory and think you all have it, but you don't touch it or actually fill it to much later in your program, something, some other task or process might have ended up using the memory that's closest to you, and you'll have to go across the chip to get memory. So what people do now is just to, when you allocate your memory, touch it. David talked about sampling and tracing, so I'll, I'll go through that. And he also mentioned the hardware event counters, but I just wanted to point out that the important the useful thing about the hardware, hardware event counters is this is something that gives you an idea of how efficiently you're using the underlying hardware. And David mentioned the typical process and some of the vendor tools. I'll, I'll point out here, and I'll mention it again later, the IPM, the Integrated Performance Monitoring, of which I'm a great fan. Dave is very modest and um, didn't point out that he's actually the one that developed it. And, really pushed it on NERSC and it's now other places too. So CrayPat is probably the most used performance tool we have on our Cray's at NERSC right now. So it's, it's Cray vendor specific and it can do just about everything you can think of that David talked about. The best way to learn about CrayPat is to visit that web page I mentioned before where we have some talks and things. But really the man pages are where all the information on CrayPat is. And you're not, that's the best source. So to use CrayPat, it, it follows the kind of common thing that, that David outlined before. You lo load a module, you rebuild your code, and then you get an executable and you run this command called pat build on your executable already. And this produces another executable that's called, whatever your program's called, plus pat. And then you run that. AP run is the parallel job launcher. And that produces another file or a directory of files for each task. I think that's configurable in some way. Containing these .xf files. And then you run another program, pat report on those files, and then it produces something you could actually read. And it also produces something that a different tool can read, too. So it's kind of a multi-step process. Apprentice is this Cray visualization tool. So it uses that additional file that I talked about on the last slide as the input. And that's how you use it. And yes? Um, does this have to be run on? The, do you have to build stuff with the Cray compiler to run this tool? You do not have to use the Cray compilers. OK. It, um, so what the, the latest thing they told me is that you do not have to use the Cray compilers. I know that's true it, for it to work. But you will get more information if you use the Cray compilers with their tool. So I stole, this, um, I stole this slide from a friend of mine, Harvey's, who has very definite opinions about very different things. So this is a, a screenshot of Apprentice. And uh, Harvey is not a pie chart guy. So he labeled that part as worthless. But, but, but 
he does like the, we do like the fact that there's a help that he says is very useful. Harvey's used this more than anybody. And very much he also likes that you have these little arrows that you can switch other views that give you more traditional listings of things that aren't in a pie chart form. So can you just say a word about the pie chart? So what it has, what um, Prentice is showing you in this case is um, this actually is not just MPI. This is all the routines in your, call, in your program. And it is, the pie chart is showing you how many times you're calling each one of these functions in this case. And in this pie chart, it's showing you how much time each of these functions is spending. Right. So this, this can be something that is very useful to you. So this is showing you that this uh, function called compute underscore diff, something is taking 65% of the time. So that's the place you will probably want to focus your optimization efforts on. David mentioned Pappy. Pappy is an API, so you have to go and modify your code to use Pappy. But it is very useful in that it abstracts away all the counter names that you never want to learn anyway. But, but Pappy then itself, of course, defines counters, which, are ag which at least are consistent from platform to platform. And for you to find out what those counters might be, you, have, you can run this command, Pappy avail. You can run Pappy avail, and it'll tell you. On the craze, there are also these AMD native events. Um, and you can get a list of those with Pappy underscore native underscore avail. Tau is also um, a performance tool that you have to modify your code for. So what you will typically do with Tau is you'll insert some macros, run the program, and then you view the results with um, this tool. It gives you more information than gprof if you're used to that. And here's a, a, a good reference to learn about Tau. And I'm told that you either will have or you already have an, a homework assignment that involves Tau. All right, Brian? They can, they can use Tau if they want to. So I'll provide it. I'm going to be writing a piece on the Piazza that shows you this is how you'd modify the code we gave you to use Tau. Okay. It's up to them whether they want to use it. I see. Okay. So they don't have to. For, the, for this assignment that's just been posted. Okay. So you useful. can use Tau. And the basic um, methodology is you load a module, you, you have to define some paths in your make file so you link against the right thing, and then define some, some Tau macros in your header files, add those macros to the code, compile, and submit to the batch queue. And then the output, um, use preprof to produce readable output from the output. So the steps are very similar to something you might do in Craypat, for instance. And here's, I've, I, while looking around for references, I found a good reference, a good recent reference here. So you might take a look at that PDF. So I've got a few minutes. So I'm going to take them to say a little bit about our experience with tools um, at NERSC. So the genesis of these slides was I was asked to give a talk on tools at a climate workshop. And I was asked to give this talk because somebody was trying to um, run a big code at our center. And he was getting very frustrated because he code was crashing and he couldn't figure out why. And whenever he tried to run it with a tool, the tool would crash. So this is not actually that uncommon, is that you can have a, you can have a bug or similar that so confuses the computer and the runtime and everything else that even the tool gets confused. So he asked me to give a talk about our experiences with the tools at NERSC. So because users often ask us, what tools should I use? Well, we give suggestions and we say using this. But we, when we follow up, our experience is, all, is almost always that very few of these tools get used. Um, a few users use a few tools that they found that they like and use them a lot. But in general, um, a lot of people only try tools once, and then they kind of go away. So why is this? Well, the first possibility is that they're so effective that they fix everything they do the first time they try it, and they never have to try it again. But more likely, it's, um, we find they're, they're very confusing, they're difficult, they don't work, people don't know how to use them, they don't know which tool to use, or it's tied to a specific platform, and they're running on five different platforms, um, or it just works with this compiler or that compiler, or maybe it's just an Intel one. And, you know, so it's not that we don't have these tools. I mentioned there's lots of tools. And some of these are fantastic tools and very, very useful for you if you find them useful. 
but most users just really don't have the time or energy or resources to take the week or whatever it is that it might take to, to use that specific tool when they don't even know if that tool is going to give them anything useful in the first place. So users are asking for tools because um, it's difficult to program these systems. And even worse now, that the, the, the paradigm, the architectures are changing radically. So what are they going to do? So they have to worry about all these things like the, the CPUs and all the caches and they, whether their performance is good or bad, they don't know. Um, they have to try to figure out how much data mo they're moving around and if they can optimize that. I.O., which we haven't even talked about now, is becoming a huge problem for people because as their simulations grow bigger and bigger and, and approach million way parallelism, they want to do I.O. from these things or one of the most important things they can do is protect themselves from machine crashes or code crashes or whatever. If you're running a simulation that takes a week on a million cores and you run for six and a half days and it crashes, you don't want to lose everything and start all over again because you'll never get those resources or time again. So they have to call, do what's called checkpointing periodically. So they have to basically do a, a data dump or a memory dump of everything they have every so often so they can recover from that and not have wasted that. But that becomes a huge, huge burden on the I.O. subsystem and on disk space and everything else. And they're finding that it's taking up to like half of their simulation time just to do these data dumps. So this is, some, this is a big issue. And so optimizing I.O. is really, really one of the most important things right now. But you also have the network, the internode network to worry about. You have threads to worry about now that people are they were trying to use threading in addition with MPI on the nodes. And now throw GPUs into the mix. And it's just kind of a nightmare from an application um, developer's perspective. So questions to you. This was actually the questions to the climate researchers, but I'll give that to you too. Is what tools do you use? What tools would you like to use? And what would you like us to support? So if you find something you think is really great, we'll certainly listen to it. And the final one is, can, they get to ex can you or anybody else get to exascale without tools? So if there's any budding tool writers out here, <laughs> this is what I'd want in a tool. So this is like, this is like something that I, prob I probably will never get, but I would like to get, is a tool that lets you, the application programmers, help themselves. So I don't want them to have to run to an expert to figure out how to do this optimization or debugging. I want a tool that helps, lets them help themselves. It should work all, or at least most of the time. It should be easy to use and useful, easy to interpret the results, affordable, because now if you write a great tool that costs a million dollars for everybody, nobody's going to have it. So it needs to be affordable and ubiquitous, simple. This is really the way I'd like it to go, is to make an interface that's simple to use. And then you run something, you find out something, and that it tells you, here's where you need to go. Or you should go use Valgrind now and do this. Or this and this will be helpful. That would be the, a great tool. So take that as a, a goal for somebody to develop tools like that. And David mentioned IPM. And I bring IPM now after that slide because IPM is, in my opinion, one of the best tools that, that that, that um, what's the word I'm thinking of, that um, is, that provides a lot of those features that I mentioned in the previous slide. So it's developed by David. It'll do MPI profiling. That's really its strength, but it also can read the hardware counters. And I, depending on the version you have, it may or may not do I.O. profiling. Um, but it requires no code modification, so it's easy. You don't have to run all these applications on your binary to produce an, an instrumented binary and then run that and then run something else to provide human readable output. So how it works from a user perspective is you just say module load IPM and then you run your program. And it produces, an out, it produces a report for you. And I'll also push this last bullet because I'm, I wrote the web interface that we use at NERSC that lets you see things about it. But it's really that easy. So it's low overhead and you're using your production code. Um, that was just some of the things that will give you, it gives you your memory usage per task, which a lot of people don't know. It'll tell you about load balance, um, call imbalance. It shows you your MPI time and your IO time if it's the right version. <coughs> David showed this, so th it, it gives you this. So you can look at this, this is a text-based output. But, but also then we take 
the output of IPM and put it into a database that you can access. Right now it's the next day or later on the web. And if you go and look at, find your job on, at our website, you'll see things. It'll give you basically a summary like you just saw it with that text output before. But then if you start clicking on things, you can find representations like this, which really barely works now and is not going to work for tens of thousands of processors. So we have visualization issues to work with. But each one of these little squares represents a different MPI task. And so this is showing you aggregate floating point operations. So you can see immediately that there are different tasks, in this case not very many, that are doing very different number of floating point operations. What's that? So each square is um, an MPI task, and this is just identifying the task. So for instance, this is task 128 plus 0, 128. So this is task 128 plus 5, 133. Okay. So the, the the geometry really doesn't mean anything except it's just a way to display, to fill the screen with little boxes. So this is that same thing. Now I clicked on, this is showing me the time spent in MPI all reduce on different tasks. So this is a collective, so you may not really be able to do anything about what MPI all reduce is doing, but it at least tells you what it's doing and perhaps, actually it's fairly common for us to find that vendor implementations of these collectives are not doing really that great a job. And we can take that back to the vendors and say, look, can you do better with this? Here's an example of, so this is more useful to you. This shows per task the maximum memory usage across your program. So this is actually a common thing that people will say is they say, oh, I thought every task was doing exactly the same thing. Why? Now, are some of these using more memory and some of them aren't? And so they can go back and look at their code and, and try to figure out why that is that different tasks are doing different things. And then finally, I'll put up this one, which is um, time spent in MPI receive calls on each task. Now, this is something you could potentially do about because if you're coding in MPI sends and MPI receives and that sort of thing. So this means nothing to me, but it might mean something to you who wrote this program Oh, there we go. <laughs> it might mean something to you who wrote this program who thinks this doesn't make sense to what I think I'm doing. Right. And with that, I'll finish. Any questions? So let's begin by thanking So this is a question actually for Brian as much as for the speakers, which is um, what do you recommend for the homework that just went out? So these tools, you know, presumably one would start with just implementing the homework without using these tools, and then you can experiment with the tools on this homework and of course use them later in later assignments in your project as they see fit. But um, could you say more about what you'd set up specifically for this next assignment? So uh, the order in which you're probably going to be using these tools are you're going to go to the websites that had the videos. You're going to watch the video of showing you how do I get an X display back to myself so I can have an X connection to a machine at NERSC because your, your codes you're going to write are going to be wrong. The first thing that happens is you, co you code a bug that's in that gets incorrect results. And you quickly want to find those bugs, get that worked out, and you want to get all that. You know, you'll have an idea. You, you all kind of, you know, group think and tell each other how you get the first answer and what the answer is. At some point, you'll wheedle out of the TAs, but we can't debug your code for you. So the, algor the right algorithm comes to you very quickly. You've actually seen it in slides already that Jim's already presented. So you'll do it wrong. So then you're going to go, you're going to want DDT or total view, and you're going to want to run it interactively back to yourself and help you quickly debug. Um, you don't get, you don't really find the bug in this homework with printf, unfortunately. You have to, you really, you could be sitting there with a debugger. Um, then, uh, you pretty much almost right away switch to always be measuring, always be profiling. You know, and you gotta kind of, you, you'll run IPM right away to see if you're kind of reasonably balanced or not. And somewhere in the homework, in the assignment, I've told you, guess how close you are to peak performance. So you're going to need to know how many flops you're doing. It's very hard to figure out how many flops you're doing with kind of back of the envelope, you know, unlike matrix multiply where I could figure it out by hand, 
let IPM tell you how many flops you're doing or let Craypat tell you how many flops you're doing. And then it's off to what, you're, you know, what profilers you like. There's high effort ones, which are like Tau, which uh, you know, once you've kind of done the initial investment are very useful because it gives you, you know, you can kind of put it in, take it out, go here, go there. Um, in the end, you know, the, to get the peak performance out of these things, you need to use something like an instrumenting profiler. Uh, but r right after the codes are working correctly, you want to start using your performance tools. This is a very valuable skill you're going to take away from this class. Knowing how to do a pick code is not actual knowledge here yet. The skill set is these tools. Start using them. You know, pick your a couple of them, drop them, use them. If all you, if, if in the end you don't really get all that fast of code, but you've learned these tools, that you can carry through your whole career. Really, I mean that. Start using the tools, even the hard ones. Put in the effort and learn the hard tools if you need to. But that's that's the knowledge you're going to take away from this. Oh, way definite experience. And, you know, I've, there's years I've spent where I'm not doing this right. All right, thanks. And, and do remember that video. There's two exceptions to that video. I'll try to fix it as soon as I can. But the machine to connect to is not used with anymore. We have, an NX, we have a dedicated NX machine. We found it so useful that we have a dedicated machine. And um, I think I actually mentioned the video, but it's not Hop2. It's Hopper. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you.